today we are in our third, third open lecture of the that is part of our course in a smart microscopy and I'm very happy to introduce Carolina Walby and uh, one speaker from Sweden this time we don't have a speaker coming uh, from uh, other countries I'm very happy for that as well and also that she's a lady and uh, <laughs> we have a speaker um, Carolina is professor in uh, quantitative microscopy in the department of information technology in Uppsala University and she also heading the bioimaging informatics facility uh, and images, uh, image analysis facility we have here in Sweden, one of our big ones and the only one really re uh, just only on image analysis and their, her research is actually focused on the development of this computational image analysis approach uh, that is based on artificial intelligence and deep learning and she tried to extract information from microscopy images and I think as well you have started as well in some clinical images but so far more in microscopy on life sciences uh, even so that your background is actually you are not a computer scientist I think you are in biology am I right if I well I, I, I have an engineering master engineering so. master as well <laughs> but it's uh, that is good because and then you understand more the life science sometimes it's complicated to do with a computer scientist um, today she's going to show us uh, what she's doing with these images and she just tried to fool me with the first one but uh, I did my good job here <laughs> Carolina the, the stage is yours thank you very much for coming and be here today well, thank you, Julia, for the nice um, introduction, and, and uh, thanks also for inviting me to this. And and I've heard it's participants from from all around the world, so so that that's that's fantastic. Uh, yeah, I tried to fool Julia with this first image. It's actually the same image, but I have mirrored it. Um, but one of them is is completely fake, uh, created by AI. And uh, although I'm professor in quantitative microscopy, I do not have a single microscope in my lab. So everything we do is, is computational. And, and nowadays we can also create our fake um, images, but I will come back to that. So um, my lecture today, I decided to um, talk about three different areas where deep learning is used today. One is for image classification but then also how that can be used for feature extraction. One is about image segmentation and how we use that also as a basis for tracking. And then about image generation, uh, which can also in turn then be used for registration. And my background is in classical image analysis. Um, and it's really my students that uh, some six, seven years ago started to push me in, in this new direction. And um, it's really them that ha should have all the credit for the fantastic work that they have contributed to in my lab. Uh, I, I do see that I have something popping up in the Q&A, but I think that we will uh, save questions until the... Uh, yes, don't worry for that. End. We save it for the end. Yes. Let me just move that window. Okay, so in, in the classical image analysis, uh, you probably all know about that, but I just want to make a quick comparison. I mean, you would usually start with some kind of input image, very often do some kind of pre-processing to compensate for noise and variations in illumination. You would next do some kind of object detection, segmentation, feature extraction, and then input the features to some kind of um, conventional machine learning approaches like uh, SVMs, or random forest or whatever. And then you get an output saying, for example, that this uh, illustrates health and this illustrates uh, sick tissue. But in each and every one of these steps, you as the uh, engineer or the person setting up the pipeline has to put in your knowledge in every single step. And then the big difference then as compared to deep learning is that in that case, you would use your expertise instead of saying that these samples represent um, the healthy and the sick class. You feed that to the network, which is very often thought of as more or less a, a black box. And then once your training is done, you can input previously unseen data and then get uh, hopefully a correct output 
based on what the network learned. But what is actually happening inside this box is an adjustment of a large number of filter weights uh, and, and parameters that are usually not too different from filters and so on that we might design ourselves, but everything happens in the background uh, and is very much then dependent on the data that we feed the network with. So really the big difference is that the features in this artificial intelligence network is that they're not designed by the human engineers, but learned from these large amounts of training data. And this holds true for, for all the examples that I will, will present to you. But then these um, uh, training data doesn't necessarily have to be something that a human has manually segmented or so on. It can also be many other sources as I will tell you more about. And the first project uh, that I wanted to bring up is a uh, digital pathology project, which is then also very much related to basic research, uh, but it's a very typical task that people would use deep learning for. And, and this area has really uh, expanded enormously in the last few years. And uh, we came across this data set because my next door neighbor had a very large number of manually annotated biopsies of prostate cancer and asked me if we could do something with deep learning. And uh, this is then on each of these glasses is a uh, very thin slice of a prostate biopsy. You can think of it as, as a sausage that is then cut along it. And then next to each of these long thin pieces of tissue is a pen mark manually drawn where there is cancer spotting next, spotted next to it in the tissue section. And together with that, we also then had a Gleason grade saying how severe the cancer is. So we got this. Uh, and the reason why we would want to automate this is that it's a very tedious process to find the cancer visually. It, I mean, even if you have um, a high definition screen, just looking through the whole sample takes a lot of time if you look at the a resolution that's high enough to make a correct decision. And then of course, if you can have some kind of um, decision support system, it would be enormously uh, helpful in, um, in the clinic. So what we did was to start from these pen marks and then kind of find the, the tissue next to it automatically so that we could cut out uh, both malignant and benign uh, tissue samples next to the pen marks. We skipped the area that was kind of in between to avoid too much confusion. We also had for each of the biopsies a parallel bi um, slice that did not have any pen marks connected to it. Once we had these patches, actually we got as many as 5.1 million patches. We had them slightly overlapping as you can see as, as well. Once we had those um, patches, each corresponding to 540 by 540 micrometers, and actually 10x resolution, that's lower resolution than we had access to. And this was a bit of a balance uh, because when you visually look at the biopsy, you make a decision when you see the context. And if you have two small tiles, you can't really, the, the network doesn't have um, access to the context of the tissue. So therefore, um, we had the best success when actually lowering the resolution and having larger patches. So we fed this into um, uh, actually two networks, uh, one that would only decide what is malignant and what is benign, and then a second um, network that would take all the malignant cases and then do the Gleason grading. And then we could evaluate this on, on unseen data uh, also unseen data from different hospitals. And uh, then for each of these sort of patches of that, then we'd of course take patches all across the sample. You could feed them into the network and then get a heat map for where we would have those patches that would have the highest Gleason grade. And this could then be used as an overlap of the original data to guide a pathologist to where to take a second look. We could also then directly relate uh, the output from the network to the um, grade that was assigned to each of these patients. And it turned out that when we uh, evaluated the system, we had really, really nice performance. 
And in the end, um, the data shows that we could actually dismiss about 80% of the negative cases without missing a single cancer case, meaning that the, the workload at the clinic could be really reduced. But then again, you want to know, does it really work? As we also went on to evaluate this on 87 difficult cases. And these cases had been selected before we uh, created our network uh, because they were difficult and they had been evaluated by 23 internationally acknowledged uropathologists and they had all graded uh, these 87 cases. And one of these 23 um, acknowledged uh, uropathologists was actually our own AI trainer. So what we decided to do then was to compare each of these experts against one another, against our AI trainer and against our AI system. And then we hypothesize that if a person has the same or, or agrees with many others, that makes them more sort of stable in their grading. This can of course be argued, but if someone is really uh, in consensus with lots of others, then we assume that's a good, uh, good grader. So then we rank them based on how well they agreed with others uh, using the uh, uh, Cohen's Kappa score. And it turned out that our AI trainer was actually the best, which was then good for us to have a well-trained system. And we, when we ranked them all, our AI system ended up on place 17 among the 23. So place 17 out of 23 might not sound so good, but I think it's important to remember now that our 23 were world leading uropathologists. And then maybe this is the rest of the pathologists in the world. So the AI system is pretty good at grading. It is as good as an internationally acknowledged uropathologist. And perhaps it could actually be used for decision support, especially in places where there is a lack of experts. And many others have been showing similar results after us. So I think this is something that we'll see more of in the future. Uh, but there's a downside to this story as well. There are limitations. Uh, we had access to 7,000 of these manually annotated prostate biopsies, and they were manually graded by really one of the best uropathologists in the world. And of course, not even these best year pathologists always agreed. So getting access to this really nice data set is, is kind of rare. So it's not so easy to build this kind of system on, on different data. And also what we saw was that uh, we needed to, we, we tried um, two different, we actually tried, tried three different scanners and the system only worked on two of them. The third one, uh, the images were compressed in such a way that it was not possible to apply the system to it, although they were visually very similar. Uh, we also used data from different hospitals, so there were variations in the stainings, but if the, if the staining protocol would be very different, it would probably fail again. And then, it's not really so exciting to only do and repeat what a human could do. You know, you want to kind of go, go beyond what a human can do. And this is something that we're quite excited about. We have been working for many years with um, spatially resolved transcriptomics. Uh, it was uh, deemed method of the year in 2020. Um, and you can read more about it in um, Nature Methods, but generally what it does is to really uh, decode what genes are being expressed directly in the tissue. And one of the things that we're looking into now is to rather than rely on the manual annotations by the pathologists, to rely on the output from the in situ sequencing and then use this to train our AI system uh, and then hopefully get a more detailed output. What we're also playing with now is now that we have this AI system that is trained to extract features that are related to morphologies that correlate with gene expression. No, no, sorry, not <laughs> with, uh, with Gleason scores. We really have an excellent feature extractor because you know, when you have a deep learning network, you have many, many layers. And then in the layer just before the decision-making, 
that's where you have features or measurements that could be used directly. So what we do now is to, to apply our network to new data where we also have access then to the spatially resolved gene expression. And without saying anything about what kind of clusters we're looking for, we just uh, kind of projected this uh, AI based feature space and then clustered. And we found um, these clusters. We then compare that to manual annotations by a Europathologist. And you see there is overlap. We have a smoother image and that is because the AI system needs a, a larger view for the decision making than the actual spot where we have the, the gene expression available. And that is of course also available through, through the pathologist. It's a bit of an unfair comparison. But anyway, what, we, what you can notice here is that the pink region um, found by the AI system has two different shades. It's actually two different clusters. Well, here it's just uh, the same pink in the upper and lower part of the tissue. And what we found when we compare this to the gene expression is that there is a difference in the gene expression between, between the upper and the lower part. And um, this is something that we're using now to, to search for, for variations and differences in the tissue that sort of go beyond uh, what we can visually see based on this AI extracted features. So in, in this sense, I think that the AI can be thought of maybe a gift box rather than a black box. And that I think that the AI in this case can help us find biomarkers that can be really valuable for diagnostics and treatment. The second story that I wanted to tell you about was deep learning for segmentation. And uh, you have probably seen many, many examples of these U maps to segment objects. And um, this is a field that has really bloomed with, with nice publications over the years. And one thing that I wanted to mention with, with this example is that um, sometimes the networks tend to need to be quite big and, and complex. Um, but what one can do uh, to sort of reduce, reduce the size is to think about what kind of a priori information one can input to the network. In this case, we wanted to segment bacteria. And uh, this would be, this is the raw image of the bacteria. But before we used AI, we had been working on, on more classical approaches to do this uh, image segmentation. And in that uh, work, we discovered that edge enhancement using eigen, sort of the eigen image of the input image really helped. And what turned out was that if we input not only the raw images, but the raw images plus this sort of feature augmented image, we could reduce the size of the network because we fed it with a priori information that it didn't really have to learn. So we could speed up uh, the whole process. And I think that's something that's important to remember. If you have a priori information that is really obvious and really clear, don't hide it for the network, but add it so that the learning process can be faster. And uh, if, if you compare here the, the output, if we have um, the, this is the, the output from the original uh, approach where we had a larger training data set but did not include the eigen image. Well, this is the simplified network where we did add the priori information. So performance of these network can really be improved both by feature augmentation, but then also by providing as much input information as possible from start. Another thing that really show the powers of AI as compared to classical methods is that when we use the classical methods, we, we were specifying what the size and shape of a bacteria ought to be. Uh, so what you see here is the result of, of these classical approaches. And it worked fairly well on all the bacteria that follow these uh, parameters of, of expected size and shape. But you see these arrows point to bacteria that were extremely long or, or had branches. These could not then be found by the limitations of the classical approach. But with our AI approach, also the expect, unexpected shapes were found because they were not limited by our, our size and shape um, 
a priori descriptions that we had in our classical approach. So in this case, when we trained the system, we started out with a segmentation result from uh, a classical uh, segmentation approach. And that helped us then to uh, reduce the need for manual annotations. Another trick for reducing the need for an manual annotations is actually to use the powers of microscope in itself. So in this case, we wanted to follow these um, unstained cells were growing on the surface. And of course we could have trained the system by uh, really looking carefully and, and outlining each of these little cells. But what we did instead was to follow the cells over time. And then when, when we were done with our time lapse, we fixated the cells and added a, a nuclear dye and a cytoplasmic dye. And then we could really easily do cell segmentation using cell profiler. Uh, and then we could combine these cell segmentations and use that as labels to learn the segmentation of the un unstained cells. So we could train a network in, by the combination of the un unstained cells and the labels obtained from the fluorescence. And then once the network was trained, we could then apply it to the rest of the time sequence. And what we got as output was something that is much, much easier to segment. It's kind of like a simulated fluorescence image that we then again could easily segment uh, using cell profiler and then track over time uh, on these uh, unstained images. So the, the learned, learning the outlines from the fluorescent data really opens up the possibility to screen and follow unstained cells. In this process, we also um, thought that it could be fun to see, you know, one of the limitations in microscopy is that you might not have enough stains for everything you want to, want to see. And then we looked at this um, cell painting data set and we saw what happens if we remove the nuclear stain and try to learn what nuclei are from the rest of the stains. And I mean, visually, it's quite obvious that you could spot where the nuclei are also if you don't have a nuclear stain. And it really did work out well. So this kind of brings me to the, the third and final um, thing that I want to talk about, and that is deep learning for image generation. And this is, was a, a challenge organized by AstraZeneca. It was called the Adipocyte Cell Imaging uh, Challenge. And they want to uh, do analysis of adipocytes, but when they work with fluorescence, uh, they're limited because the stains are toxic, expensive, and cells cannot be followed over time. So in parallel, uh, they can also collect bright field images and that they can do on live cells. And it's cheap and non-toxic, and you can image cells directly harvested from patients. So what they wanted then to see, is it possible to take a, a Z stack of these um, bright field images and learn what a uh, fluorescence image uh, would look like for the corresponding cells? And um, I'm not going to go into the details, I'll point you to the uh, publication, but my students got super excited about this challenge and spent many hours on trying to solve it and ended up setting up three different networks for each of the image channels. And it really turned out um, to work super well for uh, creating something that looks very much like the real fluorescence image. And one of the evaluation criteria was also that they would create the same per cell metrics as um, a pipeline applied to the real image. And, and that worked out really well. And similarly, uh, other limitations in, in uh, microscopy could be when you want to do traction force microscopy. You have to grow the cells of beads and you have to image the beads and, and the, the scale of your experiments can be limited then by how many beads you can use and so on. So then what we did was to have the, the calculated force data from the beads and just a raw uh, image of autofluorescence in the cell. And then we could train on the force data with the raw data at input and then predict where we would have the, the attraction forces. 
And just like with the previous data sets, and what I'm showing here is, is the result on, on unseen data. So it was not trained on this combination, but a different combination of images. And this is the prediction uh, using the data on, on unseen images. The final thing that I just want to mention really quickly is that we can also use deep learning for image registration. If you have very different modalities, it's difficult to um, register them with standard image registration methods. But if you feed the network and say, we want to, to see, is there anything similar between these images? Are there any things that repeat across the two images? And this is uh, what the network found as repeating across the two images. It's something that looks very different from the images, but it's something where the almost any registration algorithm would be really successful. So then you can align these two images and, and then apply the same transformation to these very different modalities and then continue with your multimodality analysis from here. So lots of different fun things that you can do with deep learning. And with that, I would like to say thank you and open up for a few questions at least. Thank you, Carolina. I was Great. I like the, the registration one. We do a lot of correlative here and that's uh, fantastic. Okay, Rafa, your turn for the questions. Yes, so now we will follow questions. Um, so first, perhaps a very general question, but somebody is saying as a, as a lay person that is not very involved in such things, um, they are wondering how easy it is to implement those approaches. So would it be the best, or perhaps I add here a little bit from my side, would it be the best that they try on their own or they are approach experts that perhaps are willing to help them? <laughs> I, I think uh, if, if you have some uh, computer science background, there is a lot of things, lots of open access tools and things that you can play with yourself. There's even the, the no cost microscopy deep learning um, uh, resources on, on the web. Uh, but going via facility is also very useful. Um, but, but there are many, many resources available online today. Thank you. And then uh, there's a question as well that uh, kind of uh, goes uh, with my thinking is that uh, they were very surprised by the fact that you found things in the with the machine learning that were not seen by the classical image processing. Uh, sometimes we have seen kind of the opposite that the, 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 the networks don't react well to unseen events. So they were wondering if perhaps you could expand a little bit on, on what, why do you think that is in your case that you succeeded? Well, I mean, there's, there's so much information in images and um, I would not be able to spell the same thing as a pathologist because the pathologist would have a different training than I have. Uh, but then a network that has uh, seen 5 million patches might also be able to spot something that the pathologist has not seen. So I think you kind of have to think about it that way. And um, it can also be the case that the network points, it picks up something that you a priori know is trivial, but happens to be there by, by chance. Um, there's an example of, of grading of horses to see which horses were, were suitable for breeding. And, and the system was super successful, but then it turned, that, it turned out that it had learned to recognize the copyright sign in the images because only, only expensive horses would be photographed by a photographer that would have a copyright on their images. And, and then of course, it completely ignored uh, the fact that there was a horse in an image. So, so, so a network can learn things that, that might not be obvious to us, but can very easily also learn the wrong thing. Thank you. Um, we have another question here, a bit more technical, and it's uh, if you have tried to use uh, GANs to create training data for registration. So, so um, this is a kind of GAN, and, and if you look at the publication, we have several comparisons. Uh, the, the problem with GANs is that our goal when we want to do registration is not to generate a copy of the other image, but to generate something that is useful for registration. Uh, we, we want to see what are the few things in the image that they have in common. 
because in the end, we really want to use the differences in the images as we were from, from start, uh, because that's the reason why we want to combine modalities. And, and what we extract here is only the things that, that are common or that can be found in both images. Uh, so it's a kind of a different approach and a different goal. Thank you. So Julia, how are we on time? Do we have time for one more? Yeah, let, let's do one more and, uh, and also give some to the panelists and the ones. Please try to put the questions in the QA that we can say those ones and send it to Carolina and she will answer and give and we will answer to you later. Uh, one more and maybe the panelists, if Marion or other people wants to ask a question as well. Perfect. So let's go for one more uh, related to the uh, prostate uh, gradings and using the RNA sequencing data. Um, they were wondering if the RNA sequencing data was used only for training as labels and then applied to uh, simple staining, or is it planned to always include the RNA sequencing in the future? Uh, a very good question. And the, the in situ sequencing is, is much, much more expensive and tedious than the HE staining. So the idea would be more to uh, use it for training as an alternative to manual annotations but also to use it uh, in a more explorative way to, I mean, if, if we know that there are variations in gene expression, then we can suspect it to be differences in cell types and cell cell interactions. And therefore, hopefully also something that can be picked up uh, in, in the morphology so that we can use the expensive methods to train, but then the cheap methods in, in the clinic. Thank you. So maybe now uh, if uh, the panelists have a question that they would like to pose. Mario, you are your mute, Mario. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I would have, like to have a follow up exactly on the same topic. Uh, and you said um, the machine or the network identified two areas that were actually um, actually different in the pathologist. He, um, he said that this would, would be like one region. So the question is, was it really like a like a biological difference? Do you know that? So there was something there that was not known before, or was it just like some something that was overlooked? Well, we could confirm that it was a biological difference because there was a difference in gene expression. Yeah, yeah, but what the, but and this was not expected, although. Well, well, those those genes are related to cancer, so mm -hmm. so are are hypothesis, we have still not published it, but so our, our hypothesis is that uh, it's two different, maybe two different clones of the cancer or two different levels of aggressiveness. I mean, the, the, the Gleason grade is, is, is not super sharp, it's a continuum, but it kind of shows that um, the upper and the lower part of the region were in different, different stages. Mm -hmm. um, and, and of course, if, I think also that if we had gone on to to look at even more clusters in this um, deep learning feature space, we might also be able to find finer differences. Um, but then of course, it's difficult to know exactly which differences are, are relevant. And, and I think what is most exciting is really to uh, focus on differences in uh, immune response and looking at uh, immune response differences at the surface of tumors, because I think that's where we have really exciting um, uh, target molecules or, and target proteins to find. Perfect, Carolina. Thank you very much. So I think if not, Julia is going to tell me, it's going to you know, <laughs> ring the bell for me. So I give it back to Julia for the close up. Yes, I mean, we want to thank you again. It has been well, great thank you. to have you, to have you here. There are many questions. We have 131 people and we still have 110 people. That means they were very interesting in the topics you brought and a lot of questions. We maybe send you some questions that you can answer. To do, the, to the... do so. And then I, I can also provide the link to, to the page where I have my publications. Yeah. And hopefully you can then recognize the icons and find the right publication to read more and contact me later if you want. Thank you very much. And by the way, yeah. you're also hiring. Yeah. <laughs> okay, guys. There is an advertise here. <laughs> yes, yes. I put on a note. Please forget, don't forget to say they were hiring. So um, hopefully in, in a few weeks, we'll have one more person for our facility. Um, and um, it would be great to have some fantastic applicants for that. Yeah. <laughs> 
I hope so. Take okay. care so much. Take bye care. Bye. Bye. Ciao.